When people talk about Super Monkey Ball, there's usually two distinct eras of the franchise. You got the classic games, which includes 1, 2, and even Junior. Then you have the not classic games, which aren't as appreciated. But between these two eras, there was almost like this mini era, a few years where Amuse and Vision, who made 1 and 2, were no longer the developer, and Monkey Ball not only was shifting developers, but kind of was evolving as a franchise. These were the equivalent of the teenage years for the franchise, but except for having an emo phase and listening to maybe secretly good music, they made all the monkeys cutesy and started targeting the games more for casual players instead of the arcade base the originals grew from. The first of these newer games, while not being a completely original product, was Super Monkey Ball Deluxe, which was for the Xbox and PS2. As mentioned, this was not developed by Amusement Vision, who made the first two games. This was more or less a port of the first two games, with new levels included. While it was a good adaptation, at least on Xbox, the PS2 version sucked. Porting these classics may give you the impression that the franchise would continue to embrace the original design philosophies of Super Monkey Ball 1 and 2. It would come to be obvious soon though that the original standards of this franchise would begin to deviate in the future entries, and the new developers would be pushing for something completely different, with the next game in the series being Super Monkey Ball Touch and Roll. If the title of the game didn't make it obvious, Touch and Roll is a Nintendo DS game. This is pretty much the point in the series where Sega started viewing Super Monkey Ball as more of a gimmick series, something that could be conveniently used to showcase a new console, sometimes as a launch title, and we'd see this theme persist throughout the rest of the series. Some of these titles would include Super Monkey Ball Banana Blitz to showcase the Wiimote controls, Step and Roll to showcase the Balance Board, Monkey Ball 3D being a launch title for the 3DS showcasing the 3D effects, and even phone games that would release on Apple's iPhone iPhones. The DS, of course, was innovative for its touchscreen and stylus, which the game developers would design the new game around as its main control scheme. Y you could still use the D-pad though, I did. Sorry, I really do not like touch controls. As implied, Touch and Roll would do away with most of the norms from Super Monkey Ball 1, 2, and Junior. In a sense, this game would almost be a reboot of the series, something I've said about Banana Blitz in the past, but really, as we're getting into this, a lot of things from Banana Blitz really just stem from Touch and Roll. I guess 2005 and 2006 were Sega's years where they were just like, yeah, we have these established game franchises that people love, let's just, let's just change literally everything. Sonic was different, and uh, well, you know, all the other Sega series were were dead, but you get my point. Super Monkey Ball used to present the player with three options when starting the game. These were, of course, beginner, advanced, and expert. If you were good, you can unlock a master mode. Touch and Roll, though, is the first game in the franchise to kind of do away with this concept, completely eradicating the difficulties and giving the player mini bursts of 10 levels back to back in respective worlds. While at first this could be off-putting, this ultimately makes sense for the Nintendo DS console. Looking at the trends, Monkey Ball had already been stepping towards less of an arcade experience, with Super Monkey Ball 2 having a full-blown story mode, which is the best comparison I can make for what Touch and Roll is without the story. I guess the writers for Super Monkey Ball 2 fell asleep at their desk or something that day. I don't know. Like, how hard would it have been to just been like, yeah, there's this evil villain and he stole the bananas? It could have been something. There are now 10 main worlds in the front and center experience, with two you can unlock via special means at the end. Each world has 10 levels in it, and while there are still lives, there are no longer continues. I think that this new system genuinely works well for the handheld. Having continues for 10 level chunks probably would have just made this game really easy. To aid in this new format, bananas are much more fruitful. <laughs> Get it? You know, fruitful. Okay, cut that one out. Let's not leave that in the video. Bananas are much more beneficial to the player, as getting 10 now will give you an extra life, meaning that building up a good array of lives is very easy to do and makes the lack of continues kind of a moot point. The bonus stages are also very plentiful in bananas, and because the amount of lives you can gain from bananas now are pretty easy, I actually found a lot of motivation to sit down and play them, versus some of the older games where often I would just not bother or try to get some or just like run off the stage. Here, I'll actually try for 
for every single banana if possible. Each world does their 10 levels very differently. It's kind of a hodgepodge in terms of the world presentation. They normally start off with a level or two you maybe see from beginner and then you get some from advanced and then some from expert towards the end. So it's usually a gradual progression, although in general the worlds do get harder as they go on. I feel the difficulty curve is something this game does really well. Part of the reason the difficulty curve is able to be so gradual is because when you beat a few worlds, only a few more are open, instead of unlocking one after another, giving you some sort of choice in what levels that you want to do. This kind of takes after Super Monkey Ball 2's story mode level decision making approach that many, including myself, cherish from that game. The previous Monkey Ball handheld, Super Monkey Ball Jr., was kind of in a weird position as a video game. It kept the conventions of Monkey Ball 1 in terms of the difficulties, which weren't ridiculously long, but not the easiest play for a few minutes and put the game down style you would maybe expect on a handheld. Having worlds be bite-sized means not only can you slowly progress towards something at your own pace, but you can play this game in very short chunks without having to worry about putting in a million attempts like you do for Expert and Junior, something I've never even beaten. The console is crucial to why this works. I never liked this style in Banana Blitz, because in front of your home console is when you'd expect a more dedicated and meaty MLG gaming experience and where you'd likely be playing with friends. Like if you sat down and said to your friends, hey guys, you want to play this game with me? They would just kind of sit down and watch you play it by yourself and then they would probably just leave you. But on the DS, where you're alone and miserable, sure, a bite-sized play session works wonders. It doesn't mean that there aren't downsides to this new system. Points are completely gone meaning that once a world is completed, there's really no reason to go back to a world to beat it again. There's not even like a time trial for these or anything, meaning that the replayability of this game is slim to none. Like once you're done, you're just kind of done. Monkey Ball 1 and 2 would encourage you to sit down and get better at the game, with the point system and the in-game leaderboards, and just in general was satisfying to get good at, you don't really get that in touch and roll. There are a few bonuses. After beating the 10 main worlds, there are two more unlockable worlds. World 11 you get from clearing the two red goals in the game, which these are the bonus goals from Monkey Ball 1 and 2. So here they don't skip any levels, and you don't get extra points because points are gone, so you just do them for this which I guess is fine, like I don't know, it's kind of weird. If this was explained, it would make a little more sense. The first time through, you might wonder why didn't I skip a level and be confused about why the red goals are even there. And then for World 12, you have to collect 2006 bananas. That's bullshit. I get why they did this. This game is really short and probably makes it like twice as long, but that's not really that fun. If you could have bananas count for the total during the rest of the game, I think that would be fine, but you have to collect them all after World 11, so you just go in and do the worlds over and over, and honestly that's just a really lame way to pad out the game. Another thing that's complete and utter cruelty by the game developers is that you have to watch the credits a total of 12 times, one after each world. I thought at first, okay, well the first time around it's unskippable, and then for the other ones I could just press the A button or something and skip it. So I played the mini game. I threw my monkeys at the letters. I always like that they do these little fun mini games. By the way, it's such a cute staple of the franchise. Then I beat World Two. I pressed every button like 20 times and nothing happened. It's a forced mini game each time around, which just doesn't make sense. It's not quick either. It's like five minutes too. If this happened once, okay, you know that's fine. Like put it at the end of the game or something or just make each one skippable, but having to do this every time is honestly miserable. The best thing you could do is just reset your console after beating a world, because it does save, but people aren't going to know that or feel comfortable to do that the first time around unless they have that prior knowledge, so it's just a really weird feature. And besides, some of these worlds are like 10 minutes, so does that really need a credit screen? As mentioned, there's no story for any of these levels or purpose here. I don't think there needed to be one. I mean, it's Monkey Ball, but it almost feels like the game kind of wants there to be one, but forgot to have one. Like, there's 10 worlds, you have a world map, you have some parrot who talks to you, like, who, who is this guy? But you have no motive whatsoever, besides that you're just some monkey in a ball and need to get from point A to point B. Monkey Ball doesn't need to be the next Twilight or anything, but I can't help but feel there was a bit of charm lost in the translation of development. Monkey Ball 1, for instance, it has a cute little cutscene at the start that doesn't have a story, but serves as a method for introducing the characters. All Touch and Roll has is the bottom screen with Ai saying to... 
I'm gonna pretend I didn't see that. There's not even anything in the instruction manual that adds to their charm. This isn't a direct criticism of the game, it doesn't impact the gameplay, but there is an odd sense of detachment to these characters that I didn't necessarily feel from the older games and something that unfortunately kind of carried on to future entries. However, the new character designs themselves are actually really nice. I think they are a good middle ground between the past and the future of what Monkey Ball's design would be. The beta of the game has this like gross, low poly model of Ai, Ai. And if this was in the game, it would be horrifying. I mean, look at this thing. He looks like he should be on Jim Can't Swim or something. The developers decided to go for a sprite-based look for these characters, and I think this is perfect. I like this because the fact that they were able to keep it simple meant that there were fluid animations during the gameplay and also gave each character a respect to personality. On top of this, the general art direction of this game is just super creative. I love the backgrounds of this game. They went for this hyper-realistic type of approach to it. And look, the penguins from Super Monkey Ball wonder back. Oh, that's so cute. Looking at this game nearly 20 years after the fact, I really value the path that they chose to take for the art direction. Look at a game like Mario 64 DS. It tried to recreate a console experience, and while 64 DS doesn't look horrible, it, okay, it's kind of bad. At least nowadays, at the time, the textures were blocky, the character models weren't too good, but Super Monkey Ball touch and roll aged stupidly well because of the art direction they chose to take. They played it safe instead of trying to force a console that couldn't do it to be a GameCube game. And this is what I think the best possible path that they could have taken for a DS entry was. While Super Monkey Ball Jr. is oppressive for the time it was released on the GBA, they tried to recreate the console experience there and it just didn't work as well. It's kind of funny actually, this game is really similar to Super Monkey Ball Deluxe in terms of the gameplay itself. The presentation, as mentioned, is entirely different, but when looking at the levels, it's kind of the same idea. There are a lot of levels reused from 1 and 2, with maybe half of the overall level count being these reused levels. These levels are also renamed entirely different things from the first two games because I can assume someone wanted to just say, we have two games that already named these levels, they have established names, but let's just confuse the hell out of everyone we used to be a country, a proper country. But no, they just freaking had to change the fucking names. But the new levels are pretty creative and I actually don't feel like they deviate that much from the original design philosophy of the original games. Sometimes the perspective of the camera though makes it really difficult to play some of these levels. I think the issue I have with so many reused levels is that these levels were just not made for some of these controls. As mentioned, you have the D-pad and now the touch screen, which uses the stylus to control the monkey. Unfortunately, I couldn't get a perfectly accurate read on the DS controls because I had to record this with emulator. I don't own a DS right now, and even if I did, I would have to do emulator anyways to avoid middle schooler doing a let's play game footage. I will say my instinct tells me that the controls are fairly slippery from the grasp that I did get on it. I've heard really mixed things on the stylus controls. I have some friends who told me they think it's the best way to play Monkey Ball, but most of the time I see people who agree that the stylus controls aren't the most receptive and just come off as extremely slippery slippery. Games around this time really tried to make controlling with the stylus viable. Again, I'm going to refer back to Mario 64 DS. It kind of had the same thing, and it seems these years were almost the only time in handheld gaming history where that was a thing, and I think it's because people realized shortly after that this just doesn't work. Speaking of the bottom screen, while it's cool you get an additional animation of your monkey that's cute to watch, I really wish they just made this smaller and added a mini-map, or at least you could switch between the two. In fact, it's kind of baffling there isn't one. This would be perfect for the DS. At least the option would have been nice, and the only reason this is kind of an issue is that half of the levels are from 1 and 2, which benefited greatly from having this mini-map. It doesn't make the game unplayable, but it does feel like something that was a genuine oversight. The D-pad controls on the DS aren't much better than the ones in Junior, honestly. I almost don't like that they ported so many levels over from the older games because very clearly, again, these levels were just made for a game you control stick. That's not to say all the levels control bad, I mean, some of these work just fine, but occasionally I would just find myself getting stuck on some levels that I would breeze through in the originals that I just could not do in this game anymore. Overall, I think the best thing about Super Monkey Ball Touch and Roll is its presentation, but maybe not the controls. I didn't even talk about the soundtrack yet, but the OST for this game might be one of the best, if not the best, in the entire series. I highly recommend, even if you don't want to play this game, you sit down and listen to the soundtrack on YouTube at some point. And anyways, a lot of songs would go on to be reused in Super Monkey Ball Banana Blitz. Overall though, this is a very well-made product. It's nice to look at, the colors are vibrant, the music's outstanding, and there's plenty of charm and personality to it. 
I think this is what the game should be remembered for. As someone who loved the original games because of how they looked in part, I commend the DS Super Monkey Ball title for really trying to continue that. Monkey Ball on a handheld inherently works so much better when they try to build it from the ground up for that console. I'll point back to Junior. Honestly, I still like Super Monkey Ball Junior a lot, but Touch and Roll kind of soured it just a bit more for me. Because while Junior was held back by its hardware, it still tried to replicate the GameCube just a bit too much. It had the fake 3D models, it had the difficulty modes, and it just kind of ended up being a worse version of the GameCube game. Here, with the new world system and fresh graphics, this is honestly how a monkey ball on a handheld console should be. And of course, every monkey ball game has mini games. I think these are fairly well done as well. I didn't like monkey racing. One of the biggest things from the GameCube monkey racing that makes me dislike it a bit here is when you go flying in the air and can't control your angle anymore, you just kind of get stuck and die. It kept happening here and that sucks. Otherwise, it's monkey racing. But with touch controls, the mini games that return from 1 and 2 are pretty faithful to the originals. The difference is every mini game has required touch controls now. I don't think this was really necessary. Like, does racing really need that? Like, why couldn't I just use the D-pad? I actually really love it for golf. They brought back Super Monkey Ball 1 style mini golf, and I think the controls complement it very well here. They were fine in the original, good in fact, but I love the DS style as being used to emulate hitting a golf ball with gauging the appropriate amount of speed before you hit it. It's a really nice system, and I just love that it's back in this form. Bowling is bowling. That's all I can really say on that. There's also Monkey Fight, which again, didn't need to have touch controls, like, I don't know. It's fine, but they kind of shoehorned it in. This worked just fine with a normal controller. I, I could understand if the touch controls were added as an option, but at least the mini games that return minus golf didn't really need this. It, it's kind of what YouTube does, right? They take a problem that just doesn't exist and says, we found a solution, guys. There are two new mini games, both of which I found to be great. There's Monkey Hockey, which is air hockey, which with touch controls makes total sense. It's really fun, but sometimes your paddle just turns so small and it's hard to get a power up to turn big again. I'm like the size of two atoms here. There's another addition to this where you can draw your own paddles. Now this is an awesome idea. I really love this minigame. You can make any angle you conceive as your paddle as long as you don't run out of paint. The CPU even introduces cool ideas to you, such as making a circle as your paddle. I don't know, it's really cool. If your paddle gets broken, you have to quickly make a new one, making this minigame very high paced, but also very exciting. There's also Monkey Boar. Yeah, we're going to war. Well, the war is apparently shooting food at each other. What a waste. You shoot honey, you shoot cinnamon buns. Come on, man, I was gonna eat that later. But all jokes aside, it's dumb fun. It has a control scheme where at first you're like, uh, no, get that the hell away from me. But once you play it, it's actually quite addicting. There are three maps, but I will say playing the single player is really easy. I won like every time, but maybe I am just that good. So the further I got into this script, the more I realized that touch and roll is really similar to Banana Blitz. And I know I've been saying that just throughout it, but I realized this more and more and more just as I kept writing the script. And it occurred to me, why do I like touch and roll, but really dislike Banana Blitz when they have so many similarities? And the comparison I kind of made in my head for this is that this is really similar to Super Mario 3D Land on 3DS and Super Mario 3D World on Wii U. Now, I am not saying that 3D World is anywhere near as bad as Banana Blitz. 3D World's a pretty good game, but it's always been like my least favorite 3D Mario. And I think I realized it recently that it's because it's really similar to a game that was meant for a 3DS. Like, it's kind of weird to just take a handheld game and take all the conventions you made for that and then just put it on a console. It just doesn't work as well. And I realized that this is why 3D World is like my least favorite 3D Mario. Nowadays, you can kind of get away with that. Like the PS5, Xbox One, Xbox Series X, they're all kind of the same console. But back then, considering it's a handheld versus a more dedicated home console, the difference is quite big. I just don't think you can really successfully translate a game between these two entities without losing something. Either way, Touch and Roll is a really good game. I recommend that if you can, you sit down and play this at some point. That's not something I could say for Super Monkey Ball Jr. because I was just like, well, it's just a weaker version of a GameCube game. But this is like its own unique entity and really fun. Uh, so I recommend if you can, Touch and Roll is something you play. This is one of the best monkey ball games that people may never even play. And I think this game deserves to be considered in the golden age of the Super Monkey Ball franchise. Next up, we have to review Super Monkey Ball Adventure. I reviewed that game six years ago under the shovelware banner. 
and I'm still not ready to go back to it.